Well, happy Easter. I've got some good news for you this Easter Sunday morning. Are you ready for it? Jesus is alive. He really is. Now, listen, I know the vast majority of people watching this already know that, already believe that. But even if that's you, I really want this to hit you afresh. There is a wisdom in celebrating Easter every year because it just gives us an opportunity to bring to ourselves afresh this glorious tr truth that Jesus Christ has conquered sin and death and he is alive and with us now. I wonder if, you, if I asked you, what is the single most important thing that a Christian has to believe in order to be a Christian? I wonder what you'd say that was. Um, you might say, well, pretty fundamental that you believe God exists. But in James 2, James tells us that demons believe that and they're not Christians, they're not followers of Jesus. And you, pretty much every religion you can think of will tell you that God or gods exist. That's not the thing that makes Christians distinctive. You might say, well, you've got to believe that Jesus was a real man, that he walked on the earth, actually walked on the earth. Actually, the existence of a man called Jesus in Palestine all those centuries ago is not that controversial. Even uh, Jewish and Roman historians of the era write about him. And the Christian manuscripts, the scriptures themselves, are good evidence by any way that you want to measure literary evidence coming to us from the ancient world. By any means that you know anyone from the ancient world existed, you can be confident that a man called Jesus Christ lived on the earth. Whether or not you believe that God exists, doesn't actually make a lot of difference. I mean, I'll tell you some of the other things that I know exists. I've learned, I've read, that the deepest part of the ocean is the Mariana Trench in the North Pacific. Apparently, it is so deep, you could drop Mount Everest into it, and the summit would still be covered by over a mile of water. And here's the thing. They've discovered life at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Little organisms, little bits of life down there in those extreme conditions. Well, listen, I believe that. There's life at the bottom of the Mariana Trench and there's life here. But it really doesn't make any difference to my day-to-day -day life whether that life exists or not. The truth that transforms, that sets Christians apart, is the truth that Jesus Christ not only died but that he rose again. That is the truth that transforms, the truth that changes everything. When Jesus was crucified, his followers fled. You can read about this in the Gospel accounts. You can't blame them. It seemed like everything had gone wrong. Everything they were hoping for had gone wrong. They were quite reasonably afraid that the same thing might happen to them. They all fled. They all left. They all hid. And yet only a few weeks later, those same disciples burst out of hiding onto the streets of Jerusalem in the presence of the very people who'd arranged for Jesus to be crucified. And they start preaching the bravest sermon ever and telling people that this Jesus is alive. We can read a bit of it in Acts chapter 2 starting at verse 22. Peter, one of the apostles, the one who had denied Jesus, says this to the crowds, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to God to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. 
Peter is standing in front of this crowd and saying, Jesus is alive. It's such a bold, brave sermon. You see, people in that crowd, there would have been people present in that crowd who had seen Jesus arrested. They'd seen him beaten up by the temple guard. They'd seen him handed over to the Romans and flogged. Some of them had seen the state that he was in as he staggered through the streets of Jerusalem under the weight of the cross that he was forced to carry to the point that he couldn't even manage it. He was too weak. Such was his broken condition. They had to force a man called Simon out of the crowd to help him carry it. Some of them had seen Jesus die. They'd seen him nailed to a cross, hang there for hours in the blazing sun. They'd seen the way that he had dismissed his spirit and breathed his last. They'd seen a Roman soldier, a professional killer, thrust a spear up into his side just to make sure that he was dead. They'd seen all that to stand up in front of that crowd and say he's not dead. That's astonishing. That's astounding. Maybe it's not such an astounding thing to say to us, we didn't see Jesus die. But the resurrection remains the most divisive issue in history. It's literally the thing that separates us from one another for eternity. Paul says in Romans 10.9, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is the most powerful truth that there is. Some accept it without thinking. Perhaps it was what we were brought up to believe. And on a day like today and every Easter, I want to say, no, don't accept it without thinking. Think. Think about the glory and the wonder of this truth that Jesus is Christ is risen from the dead and its implications. The first disciples were so convinced of this truth that they gave up their lives rather than deny it. Some in quite horrific ways. The trouble is numerous people today who might have the label Christian tend to abandon it at the first challenge. Essentially, that's what we do every time we sin, is we abandon this truth of who Jesus is and what he did on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. So some accept it without thinking. Others reject it out of hand as ridiculous. Of course, dead people don't rise again. That's the stuff of zombie movies and fantasies. I wonder if that's you. That you're convinced the dead don't rise. But do you sometimes have doubts? There's a danger in thinking it's only religious people who have faith and doubts. We all have faith in something. And we all have doubts if we'll just admit it. Are you ready to acknowledge your doubts and face up to them? The Roman and Jewish leaders of the time said Jesus' body had been stolen. But there's reason to doubt them. Who moved the stone? Who overcame the guards that they'd placed at the tomb? How come there were so many witnesses to his resurrection after he'd come back from the dead? And why were so many ready to die for a lie, if that's what it is? Modern day materialists say the dead don't rise. But there's reason to doubt them. What if the one who died was the creator of matter? Why should he be subject to its laws? We all exercise faith. The only question is what in and whether or not what we're exercising faith in is true. Why is Jesus' resurrection so important? Why is it the central pillar of everything we believe and live for? I want to tell you four reasons. There's lots more, but I'm going to give you four. 
The first is it establishes that Jesus told the truth. Jesus made amazing promises during his lifetime. You can read them in the Gospels. He said that he was the Son of God walking amongst us. He said that he had authority to forgive sins and remove the barrier that exists between us and God. He promised us eternal life that we will be where he is with our Father in heaven. He said that he was the only way to God. And he promised that he would never leave us or forsake us. And he said that he would rise again from the dead. Mark 8, 31 says it plainly. It says, Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, Mark says. This isn't God visiting us like some diver into the Mariana Trench, taking a quick picture and disappearing back up to the surface. This is God abiding with us, staying with us, living with us. Drinking the cup of human experience and suffering to its very dregs, even obedient to death. You know, we have a real problem, don't we, struggling our politicians. <laughs> we take everything they say pretty much with a pinch of salt these days because so much of what they say turns out to be meaningless and just an attempt to win our vote. If Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, then the credibility of every other promise that he made comes crashing down as well. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. And those that have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. Everything hinges on Jesus' resurrection. The second reason is that Jesus' resurrection confirms our forgiveness. And this is wonderful. The gospel is that Jesus gave his life for your life. As payment for the penalty for your sin and for my sin. You'd want to know that that was enough, wouldn't you? Someone's paid my debt. I want to know, has it all been paid, really? How do you know it's enough? How do you know Jesus' penalty for your sin is enough? The answer is this, because God the Father raised him from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus is God's stamp of approval that he accepts Jesus' atoning sacrifice. How much does your sin amount to? You know, guilt is a huge issue even amongst unbelievers. Even those who don't consider themselves Christians, guilt is a huge issue. We all know that we fall short even our own of our own standards. When you think the issue is not just the standard of other people around us, but the standard of a God who is utterly, utterly holy, then you realize that sin is a big, big issue. You know, the measure of our sin is incalculable by any human measure. But it does have a measure. And Jesus paid it. The great writer A.W. Tozer says, Although we feel our iniquities rise over us like a mountain, that mountain nevertheless does have definable boundaries. But who shall define the limitless grace of God? It much more plunges our thoughts into infinitude and confounds them there. All thanks be to God for grace abounding. The price of your sin was high, actually far higher than you could possibly imagine. But when Jesus cried, it is finished on the cross, it was finished. 
The price had been paid and the father's action in rising the son from the grave back to life is his confirmation that it is enough. This is our assurance. The third reason why the resurrection of Jesus is so central, so important, is that it's our assurance of power to live this life for God. In Ephesians 1.19 the Apostle Paul says that there's a power at work in every believer in Jesus Christ. And he says in Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, that power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. We can feel so buffeted by life's problems and our own shortcomings. But here's the comfort. God is at work in us. If God had the power to raise Jesus from the dead, then he has power to enable us to face whatever life brings our way. There's nothing that the power of God in us can't overcome. This is huge comfort. And here's the fourth reason, a reason that I love. Jesus' resurrection is our assurance of eternal life. You know, I've done a lot of funerals. I'm pretty confident I've done more than you, <laughs> unless you're an undertaker. Before I became a church pastor, I worked for many years in and around care homes. Uh, death and funerals was a common occurrence. And since I've been a pastor, I've taken many funerals. It says in Ecclesiastes 7.2, death is the destiny of everyone. The righteous should take this to heart. There's only two things in life which are certain, someone has said, death and taxes. And some of you might be dodging your taxes, but none of us are going to dodge death. When that day comes, what you thought was true is of no use. Only what is true and what you believed about that truth. You can have a vague hope about what might happen on that day, your last day. Or you can have a certain hope founded on Jesus' power over death. Death describes our separation from God. But Jesus has defeated death. I always picture David and Goliath, you know the story from the Old Testament. Goliath is surprised by a stone. He sees a puny little man in front of him shouting the glory of God at him and he laughs and suddenly this stone comes flying out of nowhere and smacks him in the head and that mighty giant falls. Jesus surprises death with another stone, the stone that rolls away from the tomb as he rises again from the dead. In 2 Corinthians, 2, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 14, Paul says, Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. In breaking the hold of death on him, our champion Jesus broke its hold on you and me as well, like a prisoner breaking through a gate and leaving that gate open for all those who would follow him. So I ask you, do you believe Jesus Christ is risen from the dead? Do you really believe it? You know, every Easter, you stand at a crossroads. Uh, or you're like on a motorway coming up to a junction. I don't know if you've ever had this situation. You're in a car, perhaps there's a couple of you, and you're having a discussion about whether or not this is the junction to come off. You can't stop. You're on a motorway. You've got to make a decision. The junction comes. Whatever's going on in your head, whatever arguments are going on in the car, you either turn the wheel or you don't. The moment a decision comes, and by God's grace, in a sense, every Easter, it comes round again but your Easter's are limited, the same as mine. Which way do you turn the wheel? I believe, or I'm just going to carry on, forget it. 
To say you believe but change nothing is effectively to say you don't believe. Romans 10.9 again. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, if there's a moment of surrender, you're in charge. I give it all to you. And if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that is what I'm banking on in this life and in the next, that God raised Jesus from the dead. This is the point of decision. This is the point of transformation. I love reading some of these old sort of time pastors and theologians. Charles Hodge, who's an American Presbyterian theologian in the 19th century, says this. If Christ did not raise, did not rise, the whole scheme of redemption is a failure. And all the predictions and anticipations of its glorious results for time and for eternity, for men and for angels of every rank and order are proved to be nothing more than fanciful delusions. But Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of them that slept. This means that the Bible is true from Genesis to Revelation. The kingdom of darkness has been overthrown. Satan has fallen as lightning from heaven. And the triumph of truth over error, of good over evil, of happiness over misery is forever secured. Jesus is alive. He's risen from the dead. This is our hope. This is our certainty. Jesus is alive. Happy Easter. <laughs>